Hello everyone, I'm back for another video. Um, after a wildly popular first video, which has now one view after my first two days of posting it, I am absolutely happy because it means my friends aren't going to find this channel and shit on me. So that's a huge dub for me. Additionally, as you can see, I've got this haircut and I'm looking hella cute. No, but actually. Um, so I initially said that I was going to do sequel versus no sequel for this video. And the more that I think about it, I feel like that's just a bad idea. And the reason for that is that every single time I go on a YouTube video, which is on a systems design channel, and they say, let's compare sequel versus no sequel, the more that I realize that that's kind of just a complete oversimplification of the fact that there are probably now like eight to 10 very different popular variants of transactions databases now, each with their own benefits and drawbacks. And oftentimes the benefits and drawbacks are kind of described in terms of like, the type of replication they use, the type of partitioning they use, um, the type of database engine they use, whether that's you know LSTM trees or B trees, as discussed in the last video. And what that makes me think is that you know screw just going into like let's choose a database first. I kind of have to introduce all those topics, and then we can kind of go from there. Um, so for for the sake of um, you know getting through that, first what I'm going to start with is probably replication. And then um, I'll move on to sharding after that. But since replication itself is a pretty complicated and deep topic, I'm going to start with single leader replication for today, and then I'll go from there. So um, yeah, let's get into that. All right, let's talk about single leader replication. So before I go into single leader replication, let's just talk about replication in general. So replication is when you have a bunch of redundant copies of a database so that in the event that one copy fails, your application doesn't completely stop working. And in addition, it reduces the load on each database serving request. I mean, this is something I can totally relate to and makes complete sense. You know, I get a lot of load from school. I get a lot of load from, I don't know, working out. My friends are giving me their loads constantly. So in total, if there were two copies of me, it would work really well for, you know, spreading that out. Okay, types of replication, single leader, multi-leader, and leaderless. In this video, I'll be addressing single leader. So the replication overview for that is basically this. All writes go to one leader database, and the leader can send a list of writes to other databases via something called a replication log. The reads can also come from any database. Increasing availability. So there are basically three ways to do this, and um, there are three ways that single leader replication does this, and I'll address all of them and the procedures you take. So let's say we want to add a new follower database. It's pretty easy to do in the sense that we take a consistent snapshot of the leader database, which just means we look at the leader database at a certain point in time and copy the contents of it. And that snapshot is associated with a point in the replication log. And as a result of that, once we copy over that snapshot to a new node, we can go from that point in the replication log and start making the changes from there. You can also deal with a follower crash. Um, so at the time of the crash, since all of these nodes are using durable storage via use of a hard drive, we know where in the replication log that the thing actually crashed. So as a result, once it comes back up, you can just fetch the new changes and start implementing them from the place where the node crashed. Okay, finally, dealing with a leader crash. This is known as failover, and while it seems relatively simple at first, there are actually some complexities to this that we'll address after. Failover is when you have to determine a new leader via some source of consensus. So consensus means that all the nodes have to actually be able to agree on something. Let's say one simple way of doing this is just take the most up-to-date replica in terms of where it was at in the replication log. And then step two would be all the clients need to send writes to the new leader, and all the follower nodes have to actually be able to pull the replication log from the new leader. However, there are a few problems with this. First of all is that let's say um, we have our old leader and it crashes. There are going to be some changes from the old leader that inherently don't actually get replicated to the follower nodes, which means that those changes are just going to get lost and you're kind of screwed there. Um, additionally, sometimes you accidentally fail over because all of the nodes think that the leader node is down when in reality, say, there may just be a network congestion and those changes are taking longer to propagate than you think. Um, in that event, you've basically just created more of a burden on the network by doing failover and having to reconfigure all of these things, which is pretty problematic. Finally, if the old leader comes back, we need to ensure that it doesn't still think it's the leader. This is known as split brain. If it does, it might start accepting writes, and then it would lead to all of our database replicas being inconsistent, which is a big problem. Okay, let's go into types of single leader replication. So there's synchronous and asynchronous replication. 
Uh, synchronous replication is when the client doesn't realize that it has successfully completed a write until the write is propagated to all the replicas. Uh, that is known as strong consistency. Asynchronous replication is when the write first goes to the master database, the client receives that it, the write was successful, and then in the background all of them are propagated to the replicas. That's also known as eventual consistency. So the trade-off between those two is more or less that in strong consistency the data is always up to date and you're never going to make stale reads. However, the writes basically take forever because they potentially have to go all the way across the globe and that means waiting for all of those um, I guess all of that network transport, which is bad. Eventual consistency, on the other hand, leads to much faster writes, but you have to deal with, I guess, the perils of having eventually consistent data, which means that you might make some stale or incorrect reads. So I'll go into some ways that you can deal with that now. Um, there are probably three main problems with eventual consistency where, um, you know, even though uh, most applications are eventually consistent, it's probably a fine experience for the user, but these three things stand out as being cases you probably have to deal with. The first is reading your own rights. So say that um, you're on Facebook, you're updating your profile because um, you know, you're know you 5'11", but you want to say you're six feet so that people are impressed with you. So you make your change, and then right after you made it, you read from a replica that still says you're 5'11", and you're angry because you know you want to look tall. Then you also have monotonic reads, which are when reads look like they're going back in time. Let's say there are three writes, and then you read from another replica, and that replica only has two of the writes, the first two, and you read from another one, and that replica only has one of the writes. So it looks like things are just getting undone, even though they're not. Um, how would you fix that? You would probably just have each user read from the same replica, but I'll go into more detail on what that actually looks like. Um, finally, you have consistent prefix reads. This is when there's a causal relationship between two writes, which means that the second write really only makes sense after the first one actually happens. Um, and then this happens because those writes are actually on different partitions. So that means that um, the database is split up in a way such that um, one write from one partition is going to be replicated sooner than one write from the other partition, and that's a race condition. And as a result, you only see the effect of the, the causal write. You don't actually see the, the causal write itself. Um, so you can maybe solve this by putting the causally related uh, events on the same partition, or if that's not possible, you may have to keep track of causal dependencies, which means for this write, um, you know, give an ID for the previous write that kind of caused it. Okay, so in more depth, let's go into reading your own writes. Um, you may write a change and read from a replica and then not see it. So what can you do about this? Well, for editable areas of the application, such as your social media profile, you can, all, you can have all of those reads coming from the leader which can be a little bit inefficient. So another way to kind of change that or reduce the load on that leader is to only read from the leader after, you know, say X seconds from a write, maybe 30 seconds. Okay, monotonic reads. As you can see, I have a very real chat pictured below, which totally happened. Um, so here is me readings from say replica one, but once I read from replica two, it starts looking like things are going back in time. The message from 115 is lost. And then if I read from replica three, the message from 110 is lost. And like I said, the way we would kind of deal with that is by having each user um, reading from more or less the, the same replica every single time, which you can do by hashing the user ID and then mapping that to a given replica. Okay, moving on to consistent prefix reads. As you can see, we have this version of the chat, which is replica one. You can see that causally person A has said something that has caused person B to respond but say those two messages are stored on different partitions. So now replica two um, is going to actually fetch those messages and person C looking at replica two is only gonna see that person B responded but doesn't actually see the thing causing them to respond. So person C misinterprets the context and then says something um, you know, indicating a proper response. How can we fix consistent prefix reads, by the way? Like I said, we can either get all of those messages for this given chat on the same partition or we can say for each messages, um, you know, like give it some sort of timestamp so we know to uh, like fetch all of the, the previous ones and make sure that we've got all the causal dependencies. Um, replication log implementation options. So up until this point, I've kind of treated this replication log as like a black box where it just says all the changes. But the truth of the matter is, um, you know, you have to actually think about how this would be implemented as well because there are trade-offs here. Um, you could copy over the SQL statements used to actually write in the database, but that's pretty bad because 
some SQL statements are not deterministic, which means that if you were to run them on each replica, you would get different results, and that would lead to inconsistent replicas. Um, an example of that is just like getting the current time. You could use the internal write-ahead log, which I mentioned in my last video, which basically says, like, um, for this um, you know, group of bytes, uh, make this change here. But that's also not ideal because it means that, say I went from MySQL to Postgres, um, the issue there is that uh, if certain rows are stored at different um, parts of disk, uh, those bytes aren't going to make sense anymore. So it actually provides you less flexibility in the future to potentially change your database implementation. So finally, we could use something called the logical log, which is more or less kind of, I guess, what we would think about if we had to think about a replication log just, you know, as humans, which is basically saying, um, for this row, make this change, and it would use the actual primary key. So it's a bit more verbose in terms of what you're actually doing, but it allows you to be more future-proofed in the sense that you could probably switch database engines and not have an issue, um, you know, continuing to do replication. Okay, so let's talk about single leader replication and summarize it. Um, the pro is that all writes are going through one machine, which simplifies you know, having to deal with conflicts. For example, if I had multiple leaders, I could write two different things about the same row, and then I would have to somehow resolve that conflict, which is hard to deal with. In single leader replication, since all my writes are going to one place, I know that the database would be resolving conflicts on its own, or there is at least one single source of truth. The con is that since all writes have to go through one machine, write throughput is inevitably going to be lower. And there are kind of two ways to deal with that. The first is you could partition the data set. So basically say that, um, you know, for each, uh, you know, split each table into parts and use some sort of hashing function to split it up. But then each partition would actually have a single leader. Or better yet, we could use a different type of replication, such as multi-leader or leaderless replication, which in and of itself has more trade-offs, which we will discuss in subsequent videos. Um, yeah, so all in all, I hope this explains single leader replication pretty well. Like I said, I feel like just trying to do, you know, let's choose a database without understanding all of these concepts is kind of ridiculous because the fundamental reasons that certain databases are better than others for certain tasks is because they use different types of replication schemes, different types of partitioning, um, different types of ways of actually storing the data or schemas or things along those lines. And I think it's all pretty important to understand all of those before we actually, you know, make any deterministic statements about we should use X database for X use case. So all in all, again, I uh, hope the video is useful and I'll be seeing you guys in the next one.